What up, YouTube? And welcome to my mind's eye. Hope everybody's having a most excellent day. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at a clip from the Joe Rogan experience, the powerful JRE. And a little disclaimer, I am incredibly familiar with Joe Rogan and his podcast. I've probably listened to hundreds of hours over the years, but I've never, this is my first reaction to anything from his podcast. And I absolutely love his podcasts because of the long form conversation. And to me, I, I find that much more appealing than anything on mainstream news or TV. Um, probably because in news, it always, always it's, it's so scripted. It, and even when it's not scripted, there are segments to where they only have five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever it is. They'll have a panel of people or a couple people that are talking and typically from opposing viewpoints, ide ide ideological or political sides of the aisle and kind of devolves into a Jerry Springer episode and uh, talking over each other, fighting. And I just don't find that enjoyable to watch. So podcasts are, whether to watch or to listen to, are kind of my, my go-to medium. And Joe Rogan's one of the godfathers of podcasting. And I think Mark Marin, who's another comedian, and Bill Burr, they're kind of all considered part of that grandfather of podcasting. I think there's another one, maybe Norm MacDonald was, rest in peace. Um, or maybe it was Adam Carolla. I'm not sure. But anyways, I, I absolutely love uh, the podcast format where you, you get to, it's just conversations, you know, like me, like you out there watching. This is people, how they would talk to each other in everyday life with family, with friends, people that they meet, you get to fully express your ideas, flesh them out, find out where you agree, where you disagree. And, uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoy it. So, you know, when looking at clips, what to react to, uh, for, from the JRE, I wanted to do something one that I'm interested in, but two that I found that's very close to my heart, and that's ancient history. I absolutely love ancient history, more specifically megalithic architecture and ancient civilization. And when I was a kid, I was fortunate enough to get a set of Encyclopedia Britannicas and while going through the different letters a through z of the encyclopedia set i came across greek and roman mythology and i was absolutely fascinated i loved it from the mythology of those cultures to the different wars not i'm not a fan of war but you know we're reading about the battle of thermopylae with the 300 or the Trojan War. I just, it was very fascinating to me. So I love this stuff. And if I could actually go back in time and talk to my younger self and be a, kind of a mentor to shape my destiny, I would probably direct myself, knowing what I know now, to having to do something in, in this field, in ar archaeology or studying and, and, writing about this topic. So in this clip right here, it's called, Could Sound Waves Have Been Used to Build the Great Pyramids? And I have not seen the, this clip or the podcast that Joe is doing with this person. Her name is Kristen Beck, I believe. 
And so it'd be interesting to hear what they have to say. So let's take a look. The Joe Rogan experience. There is some very strange water oh, experiments you can do with frequency. Hold on. Real quick. I need to switch my camera so you guys can see this. All right, let's move that over here. And let's mirror it so it doesn't look like I'm looking away. Bam. And there we go. All right, let's back it up. There we go. There is some very strange water experiments you can do. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Wow. You can set it down on oh, wow. plates and make some really cool stuff, too. It all shapes Look out. at that. It's so really the electricity cool. that is amazing. the water makes well, it do that spiral? It's sound, really. That's it's not sound. even electricity. Oh, it's sound. It's sound. sound. Vibration. It gets, oh. this, this is, the yeah, spout, that's what it is, right? Is Vibration. The speaker. The speaker Frequency. Is, being controlled hertz? by a 25 hertz. Oh. But if you do oh. all the hertz, you can see it. Oh my God, this is incredible. Yeah, that, that is, is yeah. absolutely amazing. And, and the, there are, this is just one experiment for this. There's a lot of other really, really cool ones. There's the ones that run through all the frequencies and you have these, uh, the balanced frequencies, which is, I'm messing up the frequencies right now. I can't remember. Wow, TBI. Voice is really I just raspy. TBI. Let me smoke another joint. The, uh, <laughs> Yeah, th so, yeah, I wonder, so that's just 25 hertz as you start kicking it up to 50, 100, 450, and so on. You wonder what kind of designs, or it'd be interesting to see what kind of designs those frequencies create in water. Now, also, this isn't a new concept to me, and there are videos on YouTube where you can find where using the same concept of sound frequency hertz and it's showing you the hertz they take a, basically a metal tray or a flat piece of, of metal and it's sitting on this device that i'm assuming produces the sound resonance um, or frequencies and they start off really low like this with 25 hertz and with the sand with the camera viewing overhead you start to see the sand vibrate and it starts making a geometric pattern. And as they increase the frequency, they put a little bit more sand because these, the higher you go in the frequencies, the more complex shapes you get to where, you know, in some of these designs, it's like something you would see this fractal pattern, like from maybe some like psychedelic uh, art or paintings or something you would see like psychedelic graphics or maybe uh, like a honeycomb, you know, like a complex design. It's really incredible how sound produces these geometric shapes. And it's, I'm really curious to understand like, what is it about the sound or how does the sound actually create the more complex pattern, you know, and it's not just like random discombobulated shapes or designs. I mean, it's very symmetrical, very uh, geomet geometrically shaped. And so it's absolutely incredible to me that sound can produce that. It changes shapes. So it goes into like this, uh, hexagram and all these different shapes yeah, depending on mm -hmm. what frequency patterns. is. So if you change the frequency, the patterns change. Right. And so if it can do that, and that's why I was talking about prayer and churches and singing, there was a time when a lot of humanity would get together at least once a week and it would sing together and it would pray together and it, no matter who you're praying to, God or Yahweh or the Creator. Well, Yahweh or the is maker, God. Whoever you want to pray to, to everybody's Bible. on the same frequency. Everybody's on the same energy. Mm. And they're giving you all this energy. How could that be bad? Look at well, how could it be bad? It depends on who you're praying to. I mean, if you're praying to Satan or, <laughs> or you know, depending, you know, what what God you pray to, Mother Nature or whoever. I mean, if there is a God, I, I would imagine 
there's only uh, one God and not all gods are real and not all of them have the power of God. So, you know, you're praying to say Thor or Zeus or whoever, um, you know, they may not have the power to, to make what Kristen's describing happen. So uh, I think maybe, maybe I'm reading a little too much into it, but you know, that's maybe a distinction and how it could be bad or, or how it could be bad. But this is absolutely incredible. I, I'm loving this. This thing. Yeah, this is some weird shit. So the ultrasonic oh, wow. waves are causing these objects to levitate. So they're le levitating That's in the that. ultrasonic waves. Is that a marble? Is that ice? I don't know. Or ice? Just, I don't even think it says exactly what they're floating there. It's probably just a piece of maybe like rice or a piece of paper or something. Holy piece shit. of rice. But kind of rice I'm, is... Uh, Jamie we'll speculate this is maybe how uh, the pyramids might have been made yeah. because of the frequencies that yeah. people think they make or m could have made, you know, back what? when they existed in the way they did in their, their original form. And if you think how? about all of I don't know how that there's, this is part of like that was something Hancock that stuff and Eddie Griffin said outside the comedy store once high as fuck. Mm -hmm. Smoking cigarettes going. I don't know Pyramids how. were made with sound. <laughs> there's a frequency. I, I can see him saying that Someone's too. talked about there's a hum in there. Or there's mm -hmm. a specific frequency mm. in one of the. Yeah. So for a lot of people that don't know, the Great Pyramid is one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And of the seven, so like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Colossus of Rhodes, uh, the Lighthouse of Alexandria, etc., uh, it is the only one that is left standing. And in my opinion, you know, of the ones, all seven that we know about it, the Great Pyramid is the most magnificent of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Um, a lot of people don't know, too, that the Earth has what's called a world energy grid. So if you think about, say, a rubber band ball, so if you start taking rubber bands and putting them together and, you know, to where you get enough of a shape and you can actually start, you know, making the ball bigger and bigger and bigger to where it just looks like a ball full of like all these lines that go all over the place. So if you think of the earth like that, the earth has an electromagnetic energy grid and it runs like these bands all across the world. And for some reason, these ancient people knew about this grid. I don't know how we would need technology. We actually need like instruments, technology to know that they're there. And so when you start looking at some of these ancient megalithic structures or monuments, say from Easter Island, where the Rapa Nui culture built these giant head-like statues and you can draw a line from there through like say Machu Picchu down in South America up through the Great Pyramid of Giza and it just keeps going maybe go back go back Lee Tempe in, in Turkey and you can do these other you know other ways through like the the megalithic Karnak and uh, I think the I think it's called Karnak I don't know my memory escapes me at the moment but in France and Stonehenge, and you can draw a line. So you got like, when you start looking at where all these monuments are built around the world, you got these lines that connect all of them, but they're all built on the this electromagnetic ley lines, this energy world grid. It's incredible how they knew that these lines existed. But where the Great Pyramid is, is kind of what's an intersection of these different lines running. So it's a, definitely a hot spot for this energy that emanates from, from the earth. And so, you know, in watching videos about the Great Pyramid and, and whatnot, people that have gone there talk about just the vibe, the, the energy that they feel in being around this, this monument and actually going up into the monu monument, say, where the king's chamber is, um, just sitting in there and they can feel the energy 
from the structure itself. They say it's like they almost feel like a charge. Their body's been charged when, when they leave the structure. And so to me, uh, like from everything that I see, I feel like the, uh, the Great Pyramid is more of maybe like a Hoover Dam. Like it uh, was built to, not as a tomb, but to, to harness this, this energy for what purpose? I don't know, maybe to uh, increase the well-being of its, the, the people around it. Kind of like a, uh, kind of like a cell phone tower. It, it gathers up the energy and then it disperses. You know, people kind of reap that or live around this reap the rewards of, of of that energy. Maybe it lightens their moods. It elevates their thoughts. I, I, I don't know, but it's um, really incredible. And I'm going to do some videos on these different megalithic sites because they're really cool. Not enough people know about them. But I, I, I don't know. I just absolutely love, love this stuff. I could talk about it forever. The pyramids, I don't remember. Ah. Well, there's some, something certainly to like the shape of the stone and the fact that it's all going to echo like crazy. And there's that and one pyramid in design. South America. You can yell at it and it gives you a bird sound back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah, yeah. Th there's something going on with pyramids. pyramids. I We're wonder a pyramid if culture. That sound. Have you ever seen that, Jamie? Where the guy stands down at the bottom of, uh, I think it's in Chichen Itza. And Chichen Itza. He, he makes some yeah. noise. What did he do? Did he it's yell? like a bird sound or something. I think he made clap. You can clap. make any noise, loud noise, that it comes back it, as a bird. It sounds weird. It's pretty cool. And that's like the temple of Quetzalcoatl, I think. Quetzalcoatl, too. yeah. I might have made that up. But that's no, like a bird. It sounded good. They're a crazy uh, bird god. Is it in Chichen Itza? Uh, Chichen Itza echo clap. But if you do the... Look at this. Oh, yeah, this is it. It's incredible. Isn't that, if you saw how big this pyramid is and how far away this guy is from it, you would realize how crazy that is. If you're listening to this, this just listening to this. This is a simple echo, actually. It's very simple to explain. When you clap in front of a pyramid, I mean, of a, of a slope, the sound will go to, to the top. In this case, a pyramid. And if it's there a, a cavity or a temple, like in this case, the echo com, will come back to you. If you clap in front of an Egyptian pyramid, nothing happens because the sound goes away. But here, the sound comes it's back. They did that on purpose. That is absolutely incredible. And so, you know, just thinking about this too. This isn't something that it's not like a happy accident. They built this into that structure to be able to, to do that. The people that built this pyramid right here, you know, they didn't just wing it. They knew like the great pyramid, they knew what they were doing. The genius of the engineering, the planning that goes into it, the masonry work of, of the stone, um, that's all planned out beforehand. You don't just on a whim or wing it, throw together a structure and hope it comes out perfect. And so then it leads you to, to ask, well, how did they even know this stuff to begin with? You know, like, I mean, I understand you, you know, yell in a big room or a cave and you hear an echo and like, maybe that'll give you some ideas or whatnot. But it would seem that with Quetzalcoatl, being their bird god that they went for a bird sound in terms of clapping or you know making a noise that reverberated off the the structure the pyramid and came back to them sounding like like a bird like to me that's intentional that's planned and you know we at least when I was growing up in, in school, I don't, I haven't been in school in a long time, so I, I don't know how much this has changed, but growing up, we were always taught that here at this time, we are the pinnacle of human civilization. We're the smartest we've ever been. We're the best we've ever been. Everybody else before us were not dumb, but less smart than we are today with all our technology and phones and computer chips and and all that stuff, but 
what does it actually mean to be advanced? Does it only mean producing, you know, uh, I don't know, engines and skyscrapers and rocket ships and things like that? I mean, clearly these ancient people were incredibly advanced, but in a, in a different way. Their understanding of e solar eclipses and solstices and harmonics, um, working and fashioning extremely hard stone. I'm talking stone that we would need diamond tip saws, uh, lasers and things like that to, to shape. They did it with apparently none of this stuff. Um, you know, like with ancient Egypt, we're told that they used copper chisels. And, you know, if you know anything about copper, how soft and malleable that, that metal is, and how hard some of these stones are, like rose granite or andesite. I mean, we're talking about some of the hardest stone on the planet, 8 out of 10 on the Mohs scale of hardness. Copper isn't going to do much of anything. It's just going to fold under the, the hardness of, of the, the surface that they're hammering against. And, you know, if you look at some examples of people chiseling granite with copper chisels, even if they use what we're told that they had, which is a stone ball and like this copper chisel, I mean, the amount of time it would have taken just to do one stone, I mean, they would still literally be working on it today, you know, thousands of years later, if that, that were the case, in my opinion, because, I mean, you're, you're looking at like laser-like precision and, and uh, it's really, really incredible. I could go on uh, with that forever because it's it's just a exciting, fascinating topic for me. But um, you know, going also speaking to the using sound, and so this is actually something that I've I'm familiar with to a degree. I've seen actually some videos on YouTube where they're using sound to manipulate matter. So uh, you know, like a bowling ball, let it, it's levitating. You know, on, on the above whatever it is that they're using to produce the sound. So it very well could be that the ancients had some understanding of sound and harmonics in a way, some ancient knowledge that we've lost clearly that allowed them to pick up these stones and, and move them because these, you know, this isn't just a, a, a pro, you know, I guess a, a question of blood, sweat, and tears, meaning it's not just throwing 100,000 guys at a stone with some rope and a couple logs to roll the stone on and move it. The logistics of that just don't add up. And some of these stones, like say the pregnant mother, which is a stone in Baalbek, Lebanon, that is a rectangle, and it's something like 16 feet if you look at it on the ground, it's 16 feet tall and 100 feet wide. And people standing next to this stone look minuscule. They look very small. In fact, there's group photos of all these people sitting on the stone. Part of it is underground, and they still look small. And this, it's been estimated that this stone weighs something like 1,200 tons. And 1,200 tons doesn't sound a lot, but when you think about it in terms of American units of, of weight, which is uh, pounds, if my math is correct, that's something like 2.4 million pounds. And not too long ago, there was a stone, a megalithic stone, not carved, but just a big chunk of stone at the, I want to say the, the Museum of History in Southern California, maybe it's Los Angeles, but they and you can look this up, the vehicle that they used to just move this stone and the, the cranes that they had to use just to pick this thing up off the ground and put it onto the bed. I mean, this, this truck with this bed is absolutely massive. I'm talking like, I think it was like 30 axles of different wheels and they had to go, only, they could only go so fast and it took them so long just to move this it was like 50 miles or 100 miles or something. It wasn't a, an incredibly long 
distance, whereas, say, the Aswan Quarry is 500 miles from Cairo. And just the monumental undertaking to get that stone down to that history museum and, and place it, it, it was a daunting task for us with all our technology and capabilities today. So how do you get to have a people that didn't have access to cranes and access to flatbed trucks and, uh, you know, all the things that we would need to move stone and put it in place with this. And so this, this stone that they moved at the history museum was only 600,000 pounds. And I say only because I'm comparing it to 2.4 million pounds. So it's absolutely mind blowing that a civilization with none of these things could seemingly move and shape, not only shape, but move and raise stones into place with, with appears to be little effort. It wasn't hard for them to do. So something that uh, a gentleman, his name is Christopher Dunn. He's an engineering uh, guy and he owns an engineering business and he, uh, he, he said something that I agree with, which is the tools you know, that are on record in the archaeological record that Egyptologists tell us that we, they had to do these jobs from the actual engineering point of view, not an archaeologist's point of view, but the engineering point of view. The tools in, 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 in the tool chest aren't, don't fit what was required to actually do the job. And so they, they were using something that was buried or lost a time or something, but it's, it's really incredible. And like I said, I could go on with this forever. I love it, but I'll, I'll do some videos in, down the road of specifically on, on those things. Why like Imagine if they figured that out on purpose. Imagine if they designed that. If they designed that, they had we to. need to figure out what the fuck went wrong. Like, what happened? Something happened to there. there. What is it? The Dryas? Yeah. Yeah. Dryas. Younger Dryas. Younger Dryas. Theory. Yeah. And nobody talks about that. Why You're don't right. we ever talk about the fact that we were very advanced human beings doing amazing things, the pyramids right. and doing this and floating rocks Stonehenge. and doing space stuff maybe back in those days. And then it all was destroyed. Now we're rebuilding. Why can't we accept that fact? Well, you know, I think it's civilization has these uh, rises and falls, and we always yeah. want to believe that yeah. we're in the middle of rising and that we're at the highest level that people have ever been because we're right. way higher than anybody that we know of. And when we look back a thousand years from now, yeah, we're way more advanced than them. But when you take into account the younger dryas impact theory, you got to get it gets real confusing Dude, because right, you start going, well, okay. If that did happen, like how smart people were people twelve thousand years ago? If if the U.S. was really covered, half of it was covered in a mile high sheet of ice, and people were creating these insane structures, yeah. like insane, th wh whether it's the pyramids of Egypt or, I mean, I don't know uh, what year Machu Picchu was made, but yeah. a lot of people date it back a long time ago. Yeah, it's as like well. fifteen hundred AD. Wait, is Machu Picchu from that era? Like when do they think Machu Picchu was constructed? But it's another I mean, one of those things. It just doesn't make yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's so amazing. None of it makes right. sense. Like it's how incredible. did you get these stones here? They're so big and yeah. it's so perfect and yeah. beautiful and the way they contoured the stone to, can't do it. to fit into these yeah. slots. It's incredible. We can't do it. 1450? We still can't. Fourteen fifty. Really? Yeah. That's so close enough. Wrong, There's no way. Oh, that might be just one of those things. There's there's one of those things where like uh, archaeologists they'll date a thing and you know you can't really date stone exactly so they date whether it's uh biological material they have to find like a piece of wood or something something yeah, that they can yeah. do a carbon dating something thing on you can't date stones yeah. so they're probably just kind of guessing they might be off and the <laughs> yeah. thing is like that becomes doctrine with a lot of people but absolutely they, it comes you know, down they found that thing uh gobekli tepe and that threw a monkey wrench into everything because for sure that's twelve thousand years old yeah. for sure so that means somebody covered it up intentionally yeah. 12,000 years ago. Yeah. That means they could build this stuff 12,000 years ago. Like, how? Yeah. How did they? And, yeah, real quick. So, like, Gobekli Tempe that was found in Turkey by, I believe, a German archaeologist. And they've only uncovered about, I want to say, like, 5% of what's known to be buried. Now, this was intentionally buried. So I think that's how they came up. 
not that they could date the stone, but they, uh, from uncovering it, found organic material below it and then dated that material, and that's how they came up with the time frame. But it's um, before Gobekli Tempe, you know, kind of ancient Egypt and, and say, Sumeria were the benchmark for as old as human civilization gets. So finding Gobekli Tempe kind of blew all their expectations and also history out of the water. It had uh, history had to be reworked to fit in this, this new find. But, you know, also I wanted to point out too, what Joe was saying about go uh, Machu Picchu and it being built in 1450. And it very well may have been, uh, or Jamie bringing that up 1450, 1500, right around in there is if you watch videos of people taking tours of those sites, Puma Punku, Machu Picchu, and you'll see the local guide who is uh, a native, right? And they talk about their ancestors. And one thing they always bring up is that, like, say, the Inca or the Maya, you'll they'll show you what they built, like the actual structure, and then the the mind blowing stuff. They say that was in part the Inca and the Maya didn't build that. They actually found that and then built around it or on it and, and stuff like that. So uh, one thing you'll, you'll see in a lot of these ancient megalithic sites is that when um, the, the more fantastic, more amazing st structures are actually the oldest, and you see the different time eras of uh, you know, buildings being built or structures being made, the, the newer it gets, the more inferior the craftsmanship gets. And it's interesting how that works. You would think it would be the opposite. But somewhere along the line, their ability to not only understand how to do that stuff, but implement it with what has to be some sort of ease or, or it wasn't very difficult for them to do, that got lost in just the understanding of how to do that plus the the ease and being able to produce it in a you know acceptable amount of time was no longer a thing and so that's when you get like these inferior structures or rocks being put on top of each other and you can definitely see the difference the distinction and the quality of craftsmanship of the old versus the new and kind of a a um I guess an analogy I like to draw is that, say, the Hoover Dam, which is a modern marvel of our engineering capabilities, if some kids were to, say, grab some spray paint and go graffiti in, you know, on the dam, and then a 1,000, 10,000 years later, some people or aliens or what have you, some intelligent beings came along and saw this structure, you know, would they automatically assume that the 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 people that put the graffiti are the same ones that built the dam itself? Or would they, you know, through study, f understand that, well, this structure is way more of an en engineering marvel compared to the graffiti itself. And maybe somebody came along afterwards, found the structure, and then kind of put their mark on it. And when you look at, say, the Serapium, in Egypt that they found that has this tunnel that I think goes down something like a hundred feet into the earth. And then it opens up to this gallery, these network of, of tunnels and stuff with no uh, burn marks on the ceilings or the walls, like they used fire. So it's like, well, how did they even see inside these places without using fire? But they didn't use fire as far as they can tell, because there's nothing, no, uh, you know, uh, burnt marks on the ceilings or the walls or, or anything like that. And then you see these boxes that are 100 tons, 70 tons for the box itself. And the lid is around 30 tons, all carved out of one singular piece. And the, the craftsmanship is absolutely beautiful and precise. And, and just, it's incredible to think how they did that level of masonry work and engineering out of one of the hardest stones on the planet. I believe it's like uh, granite or andesite or something like that. And then on the sides of the box, you see 
hieroglyphs. And the hieroglyphs looks like graffiti. It looks like a five-year-old came in with a chisel and did their, their markings. And so to me, it makes me think that the Egyptians who did those hieroglyphics didn't make the boxes. They came along afterwards, discovered them, and then put their, their mark on it, like, like the example I gave with the graffiti in the Hoover Dam. Because the, the craftsmanship of the hieroglyphs should be equal to the craftsmanship of, of the box. Nobody that makes that level of precision with that box would settle for the uh, craftsmanship of, of the hieroglyphs. I, I don't think they would allow that. They would probably destroy the box and, and start new if, if, if that was the case, in my opinion. Uh, but it's absolutely, absolutely incredible. I, I could, like I said, I could do this all day. How were they able to make these immense stone columns when we think that these people are supposed and to be hunter gatherers? They're saying the occupied was 1450. Oh, oh that's what that makes that's sense. What it's just right, the yeah, that makes that makes sense. Occupied. You know, and, and one thing too, like I was saying, is like, what is advanced? You know, what is a you got to maybe alter your perspective on how what we think advanced means. Like, uh, I can't remember if I said this before earlier in the video, but what I was taught is we're the pinnacle and everybody before us were a bunch of loincloth wearing spear chucking idiots and, you know, hunter gatherers. They weren't smart enough to, to figure, you know, things out or they're not on the level of, a, of intelligence of where we're at today. And while that may be true because we have certain technologies that they didn't have, that's clearly not the case when you actually start looking into these, these, megalithic stone structures and, and monuments and things like that, that they they were just on a whole nother level that we haven't figured out how they did it. We have no clue. Um, and it's mind blowing. I love this stuff. So that is going to do it for this video. I'm going to put the link to the original video down in the description. And I want to thank everybody that's watched to for hanging out with me and for stopping by i really do uh, appreciate it and uh, my name is trevor and this has been a glimpse into my mind's eye have a wonderful blessed day take care